You've heard of Johnny Appleseed. Well, this presentation is about Jimmy Papa Seed, and it's about bringing back in greater numbers the zebra swallowtail and the pawpaw tree. It's the when, where, how, and why. One of my favorite activities this last summer was to walk along Kent Park. It's uh, south of uh, Cedar Rapids in, in Iowa, and I did butterfly surveys for the Iowa Butterfly Survey Network. More on that later. But as I was uh, doing these walks, you know, I, I counted quite a few butterflies, which later I would look up on Google. Came across a, a zebra swallowtail, and it was a really nice butterfly, which I had not seen since I was a little boy. And I know they're not in my area. And I thought, I wondered about that. And I did some more Googling, and I came across uh, a lady who was actually, her goal was to bring the zebra swallowtail back to Pittsburgh. And that made me wonder, well, could I actually help to bring the zebra swallowtail back to this area? And so began my year-long journey to try to do something I knew nothing about. Restoring Zebra Swallowtails to Pittsburgh, a story of loss and potential renewal. The Zebra Swallowtail is a beautiful butterfly that used to be in Pittsburgh. It is now not very far away, an hour drive actually, but it's not here. We can and should bring the Zebra Swallowtail back to Pittsburgh. The Zebra Swallowtail, Brotographium marcellus, like all butterflies, has a specific host plant, which is the pawpaw tree. Asamina trilloba. It lays its eggs on the pawpaw, and its caterpillars eat nothing but pawpaw leaves. Without pawpaws, there are no zebra swallowtails. In the Pittsburgh area, pawpaw patches that were common in the past are now spread too far apart to reliably support the zebra swallowtail, so it is no longer here. Heavy industrial development, especially steel mills, destroyed the majority of pawpaw patches. Zebra swallowtails rarely stray more than a few miles from a pawpaw patch because they are not high flyers. Pawpaw trees need to be restored if we want zebra swallowtails to return. We need pawpaw corridors, not a series of oases. Remember, zebra swallowtails do not go more than a few miles away from a pawpaw patch. Pawpaws themselves do not spread unless the population reaches a critical mass. A lot of this talk is ultimately about restoring pawpaw trees. Pawpaws in large numbers are what is necessary for zebra swallowtails to exist. If there's not enough pawpaws to support zebra swallowtails, then the pawpaws themselves are... So now Jimmy Pawpaw Seed was inspired to spend many hours Googling pawpaws and zebra swallowtail and found a lot of information. In this picture we see uh, on the right is a, a video of the zebra and on the left are the parts of the pawpaw plant. The uh, leaves are long, eight inches, maybe up to ten, and they're smooth on the edges. Um, a lot of trees have these long leaves like that, but they're usually jagged on the edge, so that's one easy way to tell. And on the right are the little uh, flowers, and in between are some pawpaws. This is the uh, typical shape of a pawpaw tree, though it can vary quite a bit depending on uh, conditions of shade. And it's an understory tree, um, so since it's you know under the larger trees, it typically doesn't grow uh, you know that tall. This is a grouping of pawpaws. Uh, they get to be about the size of uh, potatoes uh, when they get uh, fairly big, maybe a large Idaho potato size. Uh, this is a, a table full of uh, pawpaws, and they're ripe and uh, the darker they get, uh, like a lot of fruit, like a banana, you might say, uh, it's a little bit sweeter, and they taste uh, like a combination of maybe a papaya and a banana. It's definitely a tropical taste. They did originate in the uh, tropics or in the southern warm areas, and as they moved more northward, so uh, the zebra followed them. And the part of the mystery of my title is, you know, how did the pawpaw move more north? And with it, the zebra swallowtail followed its host plant north. And these are pawpaw seeds. As you can see, they're pretty large. And they uh, are somewhat poisonous. Uh, they don't know if they would kill you, but they would probably make you sick. So that's another part of the mystery. 
is how did these seeds travel, um, you know, if no one is eating them and depositing them, then uh, how did they get north? Uh, there was some uh, historic evidence that uh, the Indians, once they were pretty far north, um, planted some pawpaw, but how did they travel all the way from the tropics, all the way up here? And if we think back, it's the uh, age of the glaciers, and as the glaciers receded, um, the pawpaw and some of these more tropical or warm plants moved forward. Here we have a zebra caterpillar um, next to some pawpaw flowers. And in the next picture is a chrysalis of the caterpillar before it turns into a butterfly. Just amazing how well disguised it is. In this image we have a, a group of zebras um, doing something they call puddling and that's where they uh, settle down into a damp area typically on the sand but it could be other areas and they extract minerals from from the uh, sand and water. So at this point in my journey I needed to talk to an expert and I contacted Ryman Gardens and Nathan was kind enough to uh, give me some direction as to where I might be able to locate some pawpaw and also he put me in contact with the Iowa Butterfly Survey Network and I was uh, trained to do these uh, surveys as a uh, citizen scientist and I started my uh, surveys at Kent Park in the next few images you'll see are from Kent Park in my surveys. I, uh, I spotted over I think 2,000 butterflies, I'm not sure, um, in about 30 different species and that was just between the end of July and September. And since I do photography, it's a chance for me to get out and enjoy being outside and taking some pictures. And so again, I highly encourage you to contact Nathan and set yourself up as a survey expert and find, your, find a, an area that you want to do the surveys or they'll help you find an area that needs surveys. And my journey continues. Um, Nathan suggested that I look west corner, the southwest corner of the state. And there's a park down there called Wabone Sea, I believe it's pronounced Wabone Sea. Anyway, um, I went down there and indeed they had literally tens of thousands of pawpaw trees there. And it has and it's reported there are a lot of zebra swallowtails there. I spent a weekend there and uh, talked with the uh, park rangers and they uh, explained uh, that the pawpaws like um, deep uh, areas. And just to give you an idea of how steep some of these hills are, in the top left-hand corner there's actually a person there. It's barely seeable. It's got a blue shirt on. <laughs> That's how steep these are. And at the bottom of these hills is pretty wet oftentimes or stays somewhat wet and that's what the pawpaw is like. We can see the steepness in this topographic map of the park uh, with the Missouri River off to the uh, left. And the uh, white or red areas are the highest. And then we go down into the yellow and greens and that's the more lowlands. And at the very bottom, you'll see a little creek running through there and that would be the blue, the lowest lands. And that's where you're gonna find most of the pawpaw. So now I know a little bit about pawpaws and a little bit about zebra swallowtails. But how do I grow the trees? I need seeds, right? Well, enter Red Fern Farms. Pick your own pawpaw. In the following clip, what you'll see behind Kathy Dice are new pawpaw saplings. When we started out, we called it comprehensive integrated agroforestry because we were planting trees and harvesting perennial crops at many levels, the trees, the shrubs, and then even underneath the shrubs, things like echinacea and asparagus. And, and we even had a sublayer with uh, ginseng and golden seal. We kind of walked away from the ginseng, but the golden seal. So we had a multi-story perennial crop going on. It's also called forest gardens now or food forest lots of different terms, but we're farming with trees. When we first started out, we tried to have just 10 trees of the same species in a block, and now we're even going alternate species. So like, they'd be chestnuts, heartnut, chestnut, heartnut, or chestnut, persimmon, chestnut, persimmon. And then in the alternate row, arona berries. And then in a row after that, pawpaws, chestnuts, pawpaws, chestnuts. So we're trying to mimic the biodiversity you would see in nature. 
Redfern Farms is located in uh, southeastern Iowa. But amazingly, a very similar story was playing out just a few miles from my house. I couldn't believe it. Professor Lone Drake was farming, well, I wouldn't call it farming. He was setting up his own pawpaw patches for the idea of bringing the zebra swallowtail back, but also the spicebush swallowtail and the pipe vine swallowtail. Like Kathy Dice at Red Fern, Professor Drake was planting spice bush plants between the pawpaw plants. And on the side, he would plant pipe vine. Pipe vine's a very aggressive plant, and it actually is a vine, and it'll grow over top of things. So he plants it in an area where it can grow over top of just old wood piles. That way, the zebra swallowtail, the pipe vine swallowtail, and the spice bush swallowtail all have their host plants in one place. So now by this time, I had the seeds, I had an idea as to how to plant the seeds, but where do you plant 700 seeds? Well, the answer would come again, just miles from my house. And just like all these other occasions, I was very surprised to find other people who had the same goals. Now enter into the story, Burrook Land Trust. They're just down the street, a couple miles from my house also. My wife knew I was messing with pawpaws and thought that I should contact them. Baroque maintains multiple properties in Conservancy and has been planting pawpaws on these properties for years. One of their properties, Turkey Creek Nature Preserve, may be the ideal location for pawpaws. It has nice rolling hills and plenty of water in the valleys and a lot of good shade for these undergrowth trees. This winter, I plan on discussing planting some pawpaws, I don't know, about 700 at Turkey Creek. The planting process would be a natural type where the seeds are simply planted in the ground in the right locations, where they get plenty of moisture and the soil is rich enough for pawpaw germination. So in closing, how did the pawpaw travel north? And what do woolly mammoths, pawpaws, and zebra swallowtails have in common? Well, this is my story right here, and it certainly is better than this one. This was the tale of only a few people I met along the way. There were many others. So get out there, join a conservancy, become a citizen scientist, join the Iowa Butterfly Survey Network. There's no telling what you can do if you get out there. This is Jimmy Pawpaw Seed signing off. On the way out, Enjoy a short visit with Connie, yet another person with very similar goals. Today's November 14th, 2021, and it's uh, our first snowy day here in southern Michigan, the state where I grew up, and the state where this fruit is native. In fact, this is the northernmost historically native range of this fruit that you won't recognize because this is a whole rotten bunch of it here. This is pawpaw. Uh, pawpaw is the furthest north of a tropical and subtropical huge family of plants, ancient family, Ananaceae. Uh, genus is Asimina, Asimina triloba, pawpaw. And at some point I'll get to one that's a little bit more yellow, but this is all it's, it's gotten past the fermentation stage and it's now vinegar. So very easy for me to work through this rotten, trying to get some fruit, or rather trying to get some seeds. Now here's some seeds, they're huge. It's a large fruit here, you can see about the size of one, this is squished. Um, it co-evolved with megafauna. It tends to ripen on the ground. That is, it's a subcanopy tree, a native subcanopy tree, deciduous, huge leaves. Grows this wonderful fruit, drops it on the ground, and then it ripens on the ground. Animals won't touch it while it's not ripe. Uh, but, you know, this ancient plant, plant family, it knows how to make things work. You got it had to wait for the seeds to ripen, and then you ripen the pulp. And then a giant megafauna comes by like an elephant 
smashes this and swallows the whole thing. Or, what probably happened here is the indigenous people carried it north as the glaciations went away, Great Lakes opened up, um, they would keep moving this. It's wonderful food as far north as they can make it move. So what am I doing and why am I doing it? Well, I'm wondering why everybody isn't doing this, frankly. 